What is going on everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Richard on Data. And if this is your first time here, my name is Richard and this is a channel where I help you break into data science and grow your skills in the field. This is another video in my R tutorial series and it's gonna be my second video in a series covering the tidy models suite of packages. There's Carrot, that's an entirely separate package and framework for dealing with machine learning problems. Tidy Models, on the other hand, is an entirely separate uh, suite of packages designed for tackling all the different phases of a machine learning problem. So in the previous video on Tidy Models, we had just gotten done training a logistic regression and a random forest using the training set we had constructed from the German credit data set. Now, we didn't do anything crazy here. We didn't do a whole lot as far as tuning of hyperparameters is concerned, and we haven't really evaluated how well we've done for the most part. At least you're given this confusion matrix as far as the training set is concerned, but these fits have not yet seen the test set in any capacity. So the first thing we're going to do here is use the yardstick part package from, uh, from Tidy Models to just evaluate the performance and see how well we're doing based on our metrics of interest. So if all that sounds interesting to you, Take one moment to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and hit the notification bell so you never miss an update. And then lastly, if you would like to support this channel, I'll have links in the description of the video to my Patreon account, my PayPal account, and crypto wallet addresses. Your support is greatly appreciated. Oh, and of course, this script is available on my GitHub repository as well. That's also in the description. Without further ado, let's get started. All right, so the very first thing that we're gonna need in order to use any of the functionality from the yardstick package to see how we're doing is we need a data frame that has two columns in it. We're going to need the source of truth, so the actual labels, and we're going to need the predictions. So for instance here, I wanna see how the random forest performs on the test set. So what I'm gonna do here is start with the test set, extract the class variable as our source of truth, and then I'm gonna pipe that to using the bind calls function. The predictions from the random forest when we apply that algorithm to, to the test set. So you see what we're doing? On the inside, we have this predict function. You can either have that return the class predictions or probabilities. It's going to default to just returning the class predictions. So that those predictions are getting bound to the class. Then we end up with this nice looking simple class with predictions data frame here where we got class is the source of truth, pred underscore class is the prediction. All right, so now that we have a data frame in the format that we need, the next thing that we have to do here is actually define what metrics we're interested in and what we want to report here. So the metrics I'm interested in getting here are accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, and positive predictive value. Now, I went through the definitions to these very thoroughly in my carrot tutorial series, so I'm just gonna gloss over them a little bit here. Accuracy is the percentage of the time that we're making a correct guess. And then the rest of these are going to be more class specific. So pick one of the two classes. Honestly, it's pretty arbitrary, but typically we want to go with the one that's less frequent and define that as the event class. So sensitivity is going to be of the event class, what percentage of the time is the model correctly identifying those? So in our case here of our subjects, which are bad credit risks, how often is our model correctly identifying those bad credit risks? Specificity is going to apply to the other class. So for our good credit risks, how many times is, the, or what percentage of the time is our model correctly identifying the good credit cases? For positive predictive value, you basically have to invert the definition of sensitivity. So we wanna know of the times that our model is predicting somebody to have bad credit, what percentage of the time do they actually have bad credit? You see the distinction there? So these are the metrics that we're interested in. These are pretty standard summary metrics. 
as far as classification problems are concerned. And the way that we're going to do this is by using this metric set function. So the metric set function is a little bit counterintuitive at first. All it's going to do is essentially return a function that's going to report these different metrics. Pretty straightforward. Uh, one thing I will point out though is, you'll notice I'm putting this yardstick alias in front of sensitivity and specificity, or sense and spec as they're called here. And the reason I'm doing that is because the read R package has functions also called sense and spec. So if the read R package is in your namespace, it can happen sometimes that the metric set function is going to throw you some weird errors. So I'm just going to be careful, throw this alias here in front, and that way we're going to be safe and the function's going to work. So I use this function, lowercase metric underscore set, to create this new object in camel case, metric set, which is essentially just a function that I've to that I've programmed to return these metrics. Now, we're gonna take this thing for a spin and see how we do. So, for the first argument, I'm gonna pass in the data frame we created earlier, specify which column is the source of truth and which column uh, has our predictions. Now, I absolutely hate this syntax, but it is what it is. How it learns which of the two classes represents the event case for sensitivity is you specify first or second. So if I just run the levels for this class with predictions data frame on and look at this class variable here, you notice bad is the first class that shows up here. Therefore, event level first specifies bad as the event class. So it's terrible syntax, but whatever it is what it is, I guess you get used to it. And so we end up with our uh, with our results here. So the accuracy, not bad, 74.3%. The sensitivity is horrible. The specificity is outstanding. And the positive predictive value, honestly, I think is pretty good. In the real world, if you get results like this, it's really going to depend on your specific case. This may not work for you at all. You may want to maximize specificity at the expense of, of uh, or sorry, you may want to maximize sensitivity at the expense of specificity. You may, positive predictive value could be the most important thing. Again, it all depends on your specific problem. This could be perfectly reasonable for your problem or it's completely unreasonable, but it all depends on your individual use case. What I will say is having this kind of imbalanced uh, sort of set of results where sensitivity is really low, but specificity is really high, that's incredibly common in these in these types of problems where we have a really imbalanced uh, response variable. And in fact, this problem gets worse and worse the more imbalanced the response variable is. However, there's a number of ways that we can try and uh, correct for that type of problem. And the first way that we can try to do that is by either downsampling or upsampling. So if you've seen my carrot series, you already know the definitions of these terms, but I'm gonna go through them again for this series too. So the goal of both downsampling and upsampling is to correct for this problem that we have in the response variable where it's imbalanced. So specifically here, 70% of the rows are coming from credit risk good, but only 30% of the rows are from credit risk bad. So you see how there is more than double as many good class rows as bad class rows. So downsampling is one way that we can correct for this, where what we do is we're basically removing this extra 40% and we're sampling from the two classes in equal proportions. So again, we're only using 60% of the training set because we're eliminating 40% of it. That's one approach. The other approach is upsampling where we basically oversample from the minority class. That's going to involve just throwing duplicates into the training set, but it's just in the way that we can handle this problem. And there's not a hard, fast rule for one of these is better than the other. You might just have to try both and see which one is gonna get you better results. And so how we're going to do this is we're going to add another step to a recipe. So 
I'm just going to define, as usual, a recipe with the formula class in terms of uh, other, all the variables in the data set. The input data is training set processed. Now, that's the data set, or the training set specifically, that's already gone through a whole bunch of recipe steps that we conducted before. Things like the k-nearest neighbors imputing for missing data, the near zero variance elimination, all that's already happened and this data set is the output of it. I'm just using that data set in every step from here on out and so I'm creating a new recipe with that data set as an input and we're adding one more step to that recipe where we're using this step downsample function from the Themis uh, package. Now for Themis, this is another one that you're gonna have to call separately. You can't just call library tidy models from the get-go. And I do recommend including the alias at the beginning here because this is another one that I've seen trip you up with weird error messages. So the under ratio argument here is going to specify the exact ratio that we want between the minority and the majority class. So that's a little bit flexible and you can tweak that. Now as far as skip equals true is concerned, the reason this is specified is because if we're using this recipe for another data set, namely the testing set, we don't want to apply this step. And the reason for that is downsampling and upsampling should only be applied to your training set. So this is a default, so you don't even necessarily have to specify this, but I'm going to point it out here because it really is an important thing. Now that that step has been, or that recipe has been defined, let's move on to actually combining these things into one cohesive workflow. Now, think of a workflow as a container for all the various different objects we've been working with that provide all the information for fitting and predicting from a model. You've noticed we have a lot of objects that have been floating around. We have the training and testing sets. We have these recipe objects we've created. We have models. We have model fits. And very quickly, you can get overwhelmed by all these things that are floating around. Well, a workflow, just think of that as a container for all these various things so that we can work with one object at a time instead of like 50 different objects. So what I'm going to do here for my random forest is I'm going to just create a, ra an, a random forest model object the same way that we did before. The one thing that I'm going to do that's different here is for the mtry hyperparameter, I'm going to pass to that, ar to that argument uh, this tune function. And now we're going to see that uh, in the next tutorial. What that's basically telling the, the random forest here is don't worry about the tuning for now. We're going to do that step later. Same things before with setting the classification mode and the random forest engine. And then I'm going to create this, uh, this workflow starting with the workflow function. Think of that completely analogously to like GG the ggplot function where you call that function and then you add a bunch of things to it. It's the same sort of idea. So we're going to add that down recipe that we created before and we're going to add the model that we just created here. Now, after that, we can cr use that workflow and use that to fit to the, tr the uh, process training set. That way, that recipe that we uh, created before with the downsampling, all that gets baked to the training set, and you have a training set for which those steps are truly applied to. So we can go ahead and just get a performance update and see how well we're doing. We scroll down here. I'm doing essentially the same steps that we did before, creating the source of truth and the predictions, running the exact same metric set that we defined before. And naturally, we see that we have a little bit more balanced of a result set. Sensitivity and specificity are almost equal, but we have a massive drop in accuracy. So I don't necessarily like these results more than I did the last one, but I can't stress enough that it all depends on your specific use case. In your case, it may be beneficial to have these things be as close to each other as possible, like it's unacceptable to have an imbalanced uh, result set, in which case, even though accuracy is lower, these results may even be preferable. So again, it all depends. I'm gonna leave you guys there. In the uh, next video, we're going to go through actually tuning the hyperparameters that we said we were going to later, creating an ROC curve, 
And then lastly, stacking a whole bunch of different methods together and combining predictions. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, smash the like button, leave me a comment down below, maybe tell me if you like tidy models more than carrot, then I'll see you all in the not so distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.